Humans dominate our world because they stand and walk. Walking frees us to use our hands, to use tools, and care for each other. Peripheral neuropathy robs us of that most basic human capability. Drought trepenning operates a small but rapidly growing chain of shops, infinite technologies, focused on helping people use training and cutting edge technology, such as flexible braces or prosthetics, to keep moving and leaving, living on two feet. On October 2nd, 2021, Joe, Joe joined with us again to talk about how PN affects us and what can be done. Please note his emphasis on our role to exercise and monitor our bodies. With COVID-19, the DC area PN support group moved from in-person meetings to Zoom. At the same time, we formed a new group, the Peripheral Neuropathy Support Network, to help more PN support groups get started and survive. As an initial part of that effort, we focused on helping the DC group move to Zoom only. It's been a learning experience. Great speakers like Joe have an important message that PN patients need to hear. PN wants to knock you down, but with help and determination and effort, you can fight back and stay on your feet for a long time. We want everyone to hear, but our staff makes mistakes. Boo boo in question. We did not restart the recording in time, so we missed some of Joe's introductory remarks. Please listen as Joe is explaining what his firm does and what their focus is on. A lot of folks don't know about our field until they are looking for a device, until they're looking for um, a prosthesis or an AFO or foot orthoses. Um, we try to keep folks from not having to progress through the orthotic chain, um, especially all the way to prosthetics. Um, and it really starts at a very, very early time, even before somebody both feels or thinks they might even have a neuropathy. Uh, excuse me one moment here. There we go. All right. Okay, so just some quick stats here. Uh, 20 million in the United States currently have some form of per peripheral neuropathy. Um, symptoms, very simply, um, you're looking at numbness, tingling, either or both, uh, pain in the feet, muscle weakness. Um, occasionally it is sudden it can be a very slow onset. Um, it can be a slow onset and then an injury suddenly uh, speedballs everything. It, in some cases, is medically related. A certain type of medication can cause peripheral neuropathies. Um, peripheral neuropathies can be caused by surgeries, um, hip replacements, knee replacements, spinal surgeries. Who is that? No. Um, a whole host of causes come into it. So. When we look at um, neuropathy in our office, uh, we're not really looking so much as the cause of the neuropathy. From a musculoskeletal perspective, from a movement of balance disorder, um, in our office, neuropathy is neuropathy. Um, I heard before the meeting, um, there's a conversation about CMT, MS, you know, these are all different types of neuropathy. And they all lead to really the same type of issues, um, whether it's a diabetic neuropathy, cardiovascular neuropathy, it is a neuropathy where nobody knows where it has come from and they don't have a causality to it. The presentations are very, very similar. The risks can be very, very similar. And the preventative measures are very, very similar. Um, so one of the things we look at is neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain is a sing signal that something is off with the foot, that there's something going on. Pain is one of the best defensive precursors we have to know we need to do something about our feet and about our bodies in general. Uh, pain is an initial warning sign. Pain usually happens secondarily to some sort of swelling, inflammation. Now, the inflammation can happen at night primarily. Um, where if you think your feet are swelling after a day of being on them, um, sitting down after a period of time on your couch or after dinner, suddenly you feel a little swollen, you feel stiffness in the feet. Sometimes the relief of that stiffness can happen as a result and can be pain because as that, swell, that inflammation and swelling goes away, the nerves are now allowed to flow once again, the blood supply is allowed to flow. So think of the inflammation as a giant water balloon or a lot of stuffing around a pipe. You put enough material around that pipe, it may put enough pressure on to start to constrict that pipe. 
And when we're looking at numbness, we're looking at tingling. The first thing to look at is, am I swelling? Am I having inflammation also? If we are having inflammation, the first thing to do is get that inflammation under control. Now, it could be due to fluid retention. It could be due to a vascular issue. It could be due to a clot or a blockage somewhere. But if your legs, your limbs, your feet are swelling intermittently throughout the day, that is number one priority to get a hold of. That swelling is going to constrict, constrict blood flow. That swelling is going to constrict nerve movement, nutrients getting to the nerves, blood getting to the distal tips of your toes, to the skin. And with prolonged swelling, it just like kinking a hose, it cuts off the supply. If we start cutting off blood flow and start cutting off nerve flow, that's when we start moving down the line of neuropathy and we start getting into areas of wounds and wound prevention. And I'll get to those a little bit in some of the next slides that we're going to be going through. There's a myriad of causes to neuropathies. Uh, we're looking at excessive alcohol use, autoimmune disease, diabetes, uh, exposure either to poisons or medications, infections, inherited disorders, trauma, tumors, you know, the list really, really goes on. Um, so on my website, if I was to list every possible neuropathy out there, I'd have a massive website that would be a juggernaut to navigate for anybody. Um, really the big things we look at is what the signs and symptoms are and how to best keep the body in the right defensive position for the long term to what? keep ability and balance um, as much with okay. you as long as possible. So some of the clinical signs when we're looking at um, a neuropathic foot, especially um, from the, yeah, and I won't get too deep into sort of the different nervous uh, systems that are out there, but what's considered autonomic neuropathy or autonomic or automatic as far as the nerves is you're looking at excessive sweat, sometimes dry and scaly skin. So the first thing to look at on the bottom of your feet are your feet starting to scale? Are they becoming very dry? Are you very sweaty? Sweat on the bottom of your feet. If anybody's been hikers in their younger days in the military, you know that excessive sweat can just cause really bad things to happen to your feet. So in these cases, some of your best preventatives are the simplest preventatives, a great pair of socks. Um, a great pair of socks. They're um, athletic in nature. You can get them at Dick Sporting Goods or some of our on Amazon, a sock that has what's called polypropylene uh, mesh in them is what most athletes and hikers wear. And the polypropylene serves to wick away the sweat from your skin and embed it into the sock itself. Um, wool socks are good, but they tend to trap it closer to the skin. A good polypropylene sock will get the moisture away from your feet to keep them dry. And a dry foot allows the skin to maintain its more oily nature um, and allows a nice surface barrier between the skin and the environment for protection to prevent the risk of ulceration. So one of the other big issues that we look at is the motor implications to neuropathy. Um, one of the biggest things patients tell me is they feel off balance. They feel not necessarily that they're tripping all the time, but there's an occasional stumble, there's an occasional trip, whether going up a stair or carrying an object and being otherwise distracted. And it can be very innocuous. It could be transitioning from hardwood to carpeting in the house. It could be in crowds, somebody feels a little off balance. The first thing that we look at to see if there's anything associated with that is, is there additional pain or tingling? Um, also, we look at the temperature of the limbs. If you take a look at the image here, different temperature distributions, we should be seeing a nice even flow of temperature with occasional hot spots around muscles. Neuropathic limbs tend to be a little cooler by nature. You start to see less hair growth on the neuropathic limb. And that's again, because we have constriction of blood flow. We have reduced circulation getting down to those parts of the body and we have reduced nerve flow getting to, to those parts of the body. So if we're start, you're starting to have um, tingling skin, especially at night when you're trying to get to sleep, it feels like ants on the skin, 
or your skin is very cold in nature. Um, one of the things to look at is how is blood flow throughout the rest of your body? How is blood pressure? How is the circulatory system functioning? Um, also, another thing to look at is overall hydration. Dehydration will reduce blood flow and reduce circulation. Uh, more importantly, proper hydration. Um, not a lot of sodas, not a lot of artificials. Um, we promote a lot of electrolyte, balanced waters, Gatorades, um, mat different materials that will hydrate the body with sodium, potassium, calcium, because sodium, potassium, and calcium are some of the key neurotransmitters that the body uses to keep the nervous system healthy and operational. So if we have a reduced sodium intake, if we have reduced potassium intakes in our diet, we may need to look at some ways to augment that to keep the nervous system up and running as efficiently as possible. So I'm going to start getting into a little bit more of the um, clinical presentations that I look at and some of the different um, devices that we look at. Toe clawing, um, how many folks think, you know, see hammer toes starting in their feet, bunions, um, pressure along the balls of the feet, um, hallux valgus, which is also known as a hammer toe. Um, if any of these have been thrown your way as a um, diagnosis by your podiatrist, by your primary care doctor, there is a direct musculoskeletal cause to this. And one of the things we look at for that is different types of orthotic use. So we're going to jump a little bit to this slide here. So one of the risk factors for ulceration is abnormal pressures on the feet. And abnormal pressures on the feet on very fancy heat graphs and pressure graphs look like red spots. What we should see is we should see an equal amount of pressure midfoot, right around the ball of the foot here, as well as on the heel. Um, that is a properly positioned foot, a properly balanced foot. If we go to this slide here, you see a balanced foot on the left and on the right side, this foot is very diffuse across the heel by comparison and across the ball of the foot. But in a couple of areas, you see very pronounced red spots. Those spots are at risk for ulcerations. And they're at risk for ulceration because the foot is sitting on the ground in a very unbalanced format and a very unbalanced position. What foot orthotics do, and it can be as simple as an arch support, whether custom or off the shelf through CVS, what a foot orthotic attempts to do is balance the foot. So you can see the top image here, pressure analysis without an orthotic. The heel is very green. The arch is very open if no contact at all. And you can see excessive uneven pressure across the ball of the foot. The first toe, which is the one I'm circling with the cursor, if you can see my mouse, has a very, very pronounced area of red or a very high area of pressure that's on that square. And there's a little area up on closer to the fifth toe. The bottom picture, the pressure analysis with an orthotic, all those pressures suddenly disappear. Everything looks more even, more uniform because the pressure is now dispersed across the entire foot. Another view here shows more or less the same type of heat distribution before treatment versus after treatment with an orthosis. This pounds per square inch, 83 versus 39, that is the amount of force the foot is taking in this area. And we're gonna jump back and forth a little bit here, but if you take a look at this image and you look at the skeleton of the foot, the bones that touch the bottom of the foot, that touch the ground along the metatarsal area are very small and very thin. And there are little bony bumps that stick out underneath there. So what happens in a photo here on the left, in these red spots, you have your skin getting sandwiched between the bones of your foot and the ground. And the skin cannot take a lot of pressure. It cannot take 83 pounds per square inch in those areas repeatedly. So over time, initially what you'll start to see is a callus. Calluses are your first indication that your pressures are not distributed well in, in your feet and that there's something going on skeletally that is causing abnormal pressures or musculoskeletally that is causing abnormal pressures. 
what a callus is, is a thickening of the skin in very key areas. It basically serves as body armor. And what the body does, and the body is a brilliant device, it wants to protect itself at all costs. The brain knows and the body knows if there's an area of skin that's taking repeated bombardment from pressure, friction, other outside forces, and the skin itself is not strong enough to withstand it, the body's going to start dumping more and more skin cells in that area to thicken it up. Now, the problem with calluses, um, you know, we think, great, you know, we have calluses, we're going to be protected. And actually, over time, works the opposite. The greater the callus formation that occurs, there's actually now more pressure that builds up underneath the callus and between the bone itself. So while a callus is a good initial defense mechanism, it really ought to be viewed more as a warning sign. Um, shaving calluses happens very regularly, but without proper management of the foot and proper pressure dispersion across the feet, those calluses are very unlikely to go away. And there's a much greater risk that underneath that callus, an ulcer will be brewing. And an ulcer is a wound or an open sore within the skin. And open sores and wounds over time can become very, very big problems for the foot and for the limb in general. So we're going to start coming outside the body a little bit now and looking at different feet positions. So when I look at feet, um, and some of you who I've seen in the office, and you've seen some of my staff, we are big proponents of flexibility. Flexibility is absolutely key. And when we look at different joints of the body, we try to maintain your natural joint movement as much as possible. Now, there are certain mitigations to that. If somebody's had an injury that's required surgeries or they've had fusions or they've fractured a limb and they have plates within their limb, um, those can, of course, work against natural flexibility. But when all else fails with whatever device we provide, with whatever recommendations we give, we try to look for to preserve and return as much flexibility to a person as possible. So when we're looking at the top left photo here, there's two motions that we consider. One is called dorsiflexion. The other is called plantar flexion. Dorsiflexion is if we are in an L position on this foot on the top left, that is considered a zero degree or a neutral foot. Anything in an upward movement is called dorsiflexion. And for natural fluid human walking, we look for an up position of 20 degrees. So when we're done with this presentation, I encourage you all to test your flexibility. If you're not getting to 20 degrees, or if you're having a hard time getting to this L position, then that's something to take a look at. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, through some of the rest of the slides. Plantar flexion is going in the opposite direction. So from this L position, we're basically going up on our toes. We're pointing our feet down like we're pressing the gas pedal of our cars. That is a direction that everybody can do usually very, very easily and very, very well. Normal plantar flexion is about 40 degrees on average from that L position. The Almost everybody has normal to maybe just subnormal plantar flexion. And why is that? We spend most of our time in a plantar flex position. And if we think about all the times we are awake at night during the day, um, where are our feet? Our feet are driving a car, so we're plantar flexing to press our pedals. Our feet are going upstairs, and we're plantar flexing to push ourselves up those stairs. When we're sitting doing paperwork or sitting on Zoom meetings, our feet are plantar flexed because we're relaxed and chilling out. When we're having dinner, our feet are plantar flexed under the table. When we're asleep, our feet are plantar flexed. So on average, we are in a plantar flex position 60 to 70% of the day. Compared to dorsiflexion, where we are there maybe 20 to 30% of the day. So it's very, very easy from age 10 all the way up to lose dorsiflexion. Um, unless you are an actively training athlete or a runner, or you are just actively conscious and an active stretcher, almost everybody in this country loses half to more than half of their dorsiflexion capability. So what's the implications to that? Well, some of it is down here on the grid across. The leg that you're seeing here that says neutral, that is a, a leg with a normal arch, normal alignment. As we start to gain tightness in our ankles, our leg runs the risk of deviating in one direction or another. Um, we've all heard the words flat feet. 
Um, maybe some of you have been diagnosed with flat feet or diagnosed with high arches or supination or pronation. Those are terms are very intermingled. Um, flat feet or high arches is what you're born with. You're born with a very low arch or you're born with a high arch, but your skeletal alignment follows this neutral position, regardless of the arch height. When we start moving into supination or pronation, now we start moving into a skeletal deviation that affects our balance, that affects the pressures on our feet. So pronation is when the foot itself starts to collapse inward under the weight of the body. So we're looking at a right foot here in the pronation column, and you can start to see the, green, the two green lines are starting to form a little bit of an angle. That angle is forcing our heel to swing outwards, our leg to tip inwards, and that starts putting excessive pressure on the inside of the foot underneath that first toe. If that continues, then we start moving into the line here with the red lines under the calf called overpronation, where now the weight of our body isn't supported through our ankle anymore and through our foot. The weight of our body is now out here where my mouse is. So our body isn't no longer supported by our feet if we have excessive pronation. What that also puts us at significant risk for is further tightening of the ankles where now we're not able to dorsiflex even above a neutral position, which further increases the amount of pressure put on the ball of the foot. So I'm gonna back up a second here to a different slide. So all of this red that you're seeing on this topographical map is a result of excessive pressure on the ball of the foot. That excessive pressure can easily come from the fact that our ankle is not able to move in such a way that our leg travels over our foot. So a great indication of this, and a, or a great example of this, I should say, um, is the video that I'm about to show you. So this video is of a gentleman who is wearing an ankle brace. Um, the video is in two parts. The first part is him wearing an ankle brace that has no ankle joint. And the second part of the slide of the video feed is him wearing a brace with a joint. So what I want you to focus on is not so much the brace, but the fact that in the first part of the video, there's no movement at the ankle at all. And I want you to watch what happens at his knee and at his hip as he walks down the hill. So as he's walking, his heel's in contact, but that foot isn't able to touch the ground. So the only way he compensates and maintains balance is by bending his knee and hip significantly and now walking sideways down the hill because he has no independent ankle motion. Now, when we try to walk up a hill, because we have no independent ankle motion, we can't bring that leg forward enough. It wants to snap backwards. So he has to counterbalance by using more knee and more hip movement. This is the next part of the slide, wearing a brace with an ankle joint and watch what independent ankle movement in all directions affect his overall posture. And now as he's traveling up the hill again, because that ankle is now able to move in a more natural direction, he's still leaning over for balance. I think we all would try to scale that terrain on the side of a highway, but the significance to having independent ankle movement as opposed to no ankle movement is massive. And that is one of the major things I stress with everybody I see in my office, whether it's neuropathy related, it's muscul musculature atrophy, it's diabetic related, whatever the cause of the neuropathy that's preventing that ankle from moving, whether it's a foot drop, which in the case of a foot drop, you are lacking the musculature here to pick the toes up. But in the case of ankle contractures, the muscle in the back of the foot, the calf muscle, is so, so tight that even a normal functioning muscle in the front of the leg would not be able to pick that toe up. And the results are completely the same. Locking up an ankle will cause greater instability to the whole body, will cause significantly more use of the knee and the hips, which will cause greater energy for you to have to use to walk the same distance, 
which will increase the amount of fatigue that you're going to experience. And the list of negatives go on and on and on. So what is the biggest help here? It's not the best brace in the world that I can design. The biggest help here is stretching. Stretching is absolutely key. And the more you stretch, to be perfectly honest, the less you're going to have to see me, the less you'll have to see a podiatrist, an orthopedist, a neurologist. Stretching will keep your body flexible. It will keep your balance where it ought to be for a much longer period of time. It will give you greater command of what's called proprioception, which is the ability of your brain to know where your limb is in space. Now, these, key, these are just some very basic stretches that focus on the ankle, the Achilles tendon in particular. So this stretch, this stretch, and this stretch are all focusing on the Achilles tendon. So out of four stretches that I use in my examples, three of them are focusing on the Achilles tendon because the Achilles tendon is that important to maintain flexibility. All our other muscles will get a little bit tight over time, but Achilles tendons, number one, are the first ones to get tight. Um, women wearing high heels, men wearing cowboy boots for the, their entire lives will develop Achilles tendon tightness twice as fast as people who are wearing flats. As we get older in life, the tightness takes root. The muscles become harder and harder to stretch. But the, the, and the important but here is everybody can stretch. It's going to take more time the older we are, for sure, than a 10-year-old or a high school athlete to gain the same amount of flexibility. But everybody can stretch out their, their tendons, can stretch out their joints. And these type of stretches are critical to reducing the amount of force that you will experience on the ball of your foot. Now, the more flexibility we achieve here, the less likely we will be to develop hammer toes. So what a hammer toe is, you see the start of hammer toes in this figure here. Um, one of the big hallmarks to a hammer toe is a dropped front of the foot here. It almost looks like a spoon. It looks like when you're looking at the top of a spoon and you see that concave surface, that is the initial precursor to hammer toes. Why do hammer toes happen? We're gonna jump back a couple slides here. The front tendons of the foot that control the foot moving up and down, the main muscle connects right here at the middle of the foot. The muscles that connect out to the toes, the toe extensors, do not lift the foot. But when we have a very tight Achilles tendon and we cannot use the muscle that connects here to lift the foot, again, the body is very, very clever. The body starts to use the muscles of the toes to help lift that foot because five muscles are better than one. And if one muscle isn't mechanically able to lift the foot because of a tight Achilles tendon, then the body's going to use five more muscles. Over time, what happens is the tendons that connect those muscles down to the toes start to stretch out. And when those tendons start to stretch, instead of the toe getting pulled up, the toe starts getting pulled backwards. And as the toe gets pulled backwards, that is the start of hammer toes. So the best way to relieve hammer toes and prevent them from getting worse is to engage in ankle stretching. That will help preserve ankle flexibility. So a foot orthotic is a very simple device that can do a world of good for everybody. When looking at the two feet here on the slides, this is a very classic pronated foot. The entire inside of the foot is collapsed. There's no arch. If this foot comes off the ground, an arch is there. But under the person's weight, that arch completely collapses. This is an example of a very cavus foot, where again, the skeletal system has been shifted out of alignment, providing for a very high arch. What a foot orthotics job is to do is when possible, return the foot to a corrected neutral position. And by returning the foot to a corrected neutral position, it recenters and rebalances all of the pressures on the foot. Now, can we jump from this position to fully corrected overnight? Usually not, um, unless the patient is very flexible. So again, this is where we focus on flexibility. 
for me to correct this foot here that's very pronated, if I use a corrective orthotic, I run the risk of making that patient worse day one because their foot's not flexible enough to accommodate to the device. When we use an orthotic in conjunction with stretching, whether it's a stretching device or it's physical therapy or it's exercises, then we have a good combination to gain flexibility and proper position at the same time. Different materials are very important, um, especially in a neuropathic foot. We don't wanna use anything that's too hard. We don't wanna use rigid materials. Um, leather covers are not typically recommended because it does not give proper cushioning to the foot. And more importantly, with the neuropathic foot, there's a loss of sensation. So standing on something very rigid, a lot of folks do not have the right feedback to know that their foot's hurting and that there is pain as a result of that hard surface. So we use multi-density foams, we use neoprenes, we use different soft interfaces to help provide that cushion so that bony prominences can sink into the cushion correctly and be properly cradled. But more importantly, all of the pressures are distributed across the foot. Shoe wear is extremely important. Um, the shoe is the first thing that touches the ground. So the best orthotic in the world that I would make to correct a pronation, pronated position, if this orthotic is inside a shoe that's three years old, that has a sole that's worn excessively on one side or worn to such a degree you can almost see the inside of the shoe, then everything inside of that shoe, my orthotic, your foot, your leg, is going to be tipped in the wrong direction. So the other thing that I advocate that has nothing to do with anything I do in my office is the right shoe wear. And not only the right shoe wear, but knowing when to recycle those favorite shoes and getting rid of those favorite shoes. On average, a pair of shoes should be recycled annually. If you're looking at a pair of shoes you've had for three, four, five years, it's probably time to get rid of that pair of shoes. Even if the sole of the shoe looks pretty good, the mechanics of the shoe, because you can get forces to either side of the shoe, the actual shell of that shoe might be worn down from years of contact and years of being pushed on one side. So it's a good habit to get into to replace your shoes on an annual basis. If we're looking at bigger braces and we're looking at um, ankle orthoses, um, one of the key goals for an ankle orthosis is to assist with a weak muscle. Now, ankle orthoses do not return a muscle strength. They will not return strength to a muscle or the ability to uh, pick up your foot or walk the way you used to outside of that brace. I always um, compare AFOs and ankle braces to eyeglasses. Um, the degree and strength of an eyeglass is directly correlated with the amount of eye weakness you have. And whether you're severely nearsighted or severely farsighted, or you just have a little bit of correction you need, your eyeglass prescription is going to go up and down based on that. Ankle braces are no different. The the more flexible you are, the easier it is to control your leg, the thinner, the lighter a brace can be. If you're very tight or you have significant weakness, the bigger a brace needs to be to match that level of weakness. But a brace on its own does not return muscle strength. So people ask me sometimes, do I need to wear my brace all of the time? Well, the answer is not necessarily yes or no. The answer is you wear the brace when you want to be controlled and supported. Um, if you're going out for a special event and you have a pair of shoes you want to wear that match your suit or match your dress and the brace does not fit in that particular shoe, be very careful when walking and know you're not going to have that level of stability and control as you do when you wear your brace. Braces do their job when they're worn, but they're not really needed to be worn all of the time in some cases. If you have such a degree of weakness where you need to wear your brace all the time, then yes, a brace should be worn all the time and then the shoes should accommodate the brace. Some examples of different AFOs that um, are out there. These are all are primarily carbon fiber braces. Some of the benefits to carbon fiber on a material basis is that it can be thinner and lighter than uh, the, their plastic counterparts. 
So the brace here on the left is a full black plastic uh, solid ankle brace. The braces here on the right are all carbon fiber. Uh, by and large, the carbon fiber braces are 50% thinner than a plastic brace while maintaining a strength integrity at twice as great as their plastic counterparts. They tend to last twice as long because the carbon fiber is more rigid and more durable to sustained forces, and they tend to fit better in shoes. So if you are in the need of ankle braces of this type of support, uh, primarily for foot drop, I do encourage you to look at carbon fiber as an alternative um, because it's less brace overall touching your body and they're thinner and they're lighter and they tend to fit better in your existing set of shoes instead of having to go out and buy a shoe that's a size and a half, two sizes greater just to accommodate that particular brace. So looking briefly as to hopefully what doesn't happen, but when an ulcer happens, um, one of the first things to look at is off-weighting that ulcer as quickly and effectively as possible. Um, and this is a very extreme way of offloading an ulcer, um, but it's great for an example purpose here. So the, really the purpose to offload an ulcer is exactly as it sounds. We take all the pressure and all the contact that would be underneath that ulcered area and remove it, but also being conscious of providing support to the rest of the foot. So this type of a boot here has different little plug and play hexagonal pieces that can be physically removed um, to create an opening underneath an ulcer. This can also be achieved in any foot orthosis or AFO with different padding accommodations and combinations with the goal again of making sure that we are giving a nice opening that is thick enough so that when you stand on this, that that ulcered area is not touching anything rigid below it. Um, it's basically putting like a little bit of an air pillow around that ulcer site. Um, it can be done in a boot in this fashion. It could be done in a foot orthosis in this fashion or in a brace as well. Um, Keeping in mind that if we do it in a foot orthosis or something that goes in your shoe, because in some cases we have to deal with very thick material to properly offload the foot, that's going to create crowding inside a shoe. And in those cases, sometimes a bigger shoe is needed temporarily to give enough room for your foot, for your sock, for the offloading insert, all to fit inside that shoe. So just a quick picture here of hopefully what we don't want happening, which again is the ulcerative foot. Right here is where we would put that opening for the relief, a secondary opening for a relief in this area. Again, either in a foot orthosis, if someone's flexible enough and otherwise able to use a foot orthosis or in a boot or in some sort of a closed contact type of a brace to prevent the mobility and by preventing mobility in a boot such as this or a brace in this fashion, we are preventing the excessive pressure that would occur in that ulcer site. So again, keeping in mind that pressure in this area happens as a result of immobility in this area, by locking up the foot in a boot, it does temporarily translate all of that pressure up higher into the body. But again, looking at that video I showed you of the gentleman walking in the solid brace, there is a significant amount of side effects to locking up the ankle. And that is not a first course that we would recommend clinically uh, because of the different ramifications that ensue. So again, the, some of the biggest things that we focus on is education. Um, it's amazing to me the number of healthcare providers that do focus purely on the ulcer and not all of the certain causes that can mitigate the success of healing that ulcer. Um, so really engaging in a conversation with your medical professional and understanding that just healing the ulcer isn't enough. Um, and some doctors, some therapists, some clinicians, once they see the ulcer is healed, then they're good. Then they walk away. The engagement is over at that point until an ulcer happens again. Um, it really ought to be a long-term engagement. 
not just to heal an initial ulcer or to reverse the warning signs of pre-ulcerative skin, but how do we prevent this from happening again? What are the things that need to be done to prevent ulcers from happening again? And those are the key, combina- key conversations to have with any member of your medical team. Um, self-inspection mm-hmm. of feet is absolutely critical. Um, looking at your feet every day, twice a day if needed, if you've known you've been out walking for a period of time, give your feet a quick look. Look for red marks, look for dry skin, look for the start of flaky skin or calluses. Those are all the things to look at as warning signs, but also look at your flexibility. Make sure, you know, if you're feeling, oh, my feet are stiff, well, it may not be a result of I walked two miles in the mall shopping for Christmas. Stiff feet could be, yes, I did walk that distance, but it's because of my flexibility and lack of flexibility that is causing that stiffness from happening. Padded socks and shoes are critical, uh, but more often than that, the correct socks and shoes are even more critical. So again, I encourage everybody to go through your shoe collection, um, part with the shoes that you feel are your best friends and are your old standbys that are the most comfortable shoes in the world. The most comfortable shoes in the world are more often than not the least supportive shoes that are out there. Um, And the roomiest shoes where you can just kind of slide in, slide out, um, they're comfortable to wear around the house, are most likely not giving you the support you need. So not that, I, not that I ever advocate sacrificing comfort for style or vice versa, but try to find the right combination of comfort and style and support is absolutely key to the right pair of shoes. So with that, I'll open everything up to uh, questions if you guys have any. Okay, Steve, do you want to hold the questions? Go ahead. You need to unmute. Steve, you need to unmute. Okay, we're going to move on. Uh, uh, am I unmuted? Now yep, you are. Now. Go okay. ahead. So I could maybe start with my experience at my doctor where he told me I have a mechanical problem where over the years my feet have turned inward kind of. I thought they were turning outward, but he said you sort of walk inward and it causes these abrasions and the sores. And what he's proposing is once the current sores I have heal, I should consider uh, doing this uh, tendon transfer on the feet to prevent the foot from uh, mechanically moving in the wrong way. So you and I talked about that briefly and and you didn't seem to disagree with that. Can you just speak about that as an option? Yeah, sure to prevent Absolutely. the sores from coming back. Um, are my slides still up or can you guys no. no longer see? No, they are down. They're down, okay. All right, so one of the slides that I had shown um, where we were talking about the pronated foot and the supinated foot uh, versus a neutral foot. Um, that what Steve is talking about there is when your foot, when there is significant muscle imbalance uh, to a leg and to a, an ankle joint, Because the ankle joint can move in every direction, if you think, um, if you have a a set of mechanics tools, you think of like a universal socket joint, um, the foot can move in all directions like a ball on a stick. So when muscles start to become off balanced, the foot will start to deviate either in or out. And when the foot deviates in or out, the pressures that are typically going across the entire foot, because the the weight of the body has not changed. You know, a 150 pound person is still a 150 pound person, regardless of the position of their feet. But the narrower base of support that we provide, that 150 pounds is going to get concentrated into a smaller and smaller area. So why ulcers start to occur on the outside of the foot or the inside of the foot, because the foot is tipping in one direction or another, is directly correlated to the amount of surface area that that 150 pounds has to disperse itself and distribute itself across the foot. So yes, one approach is surgically where they take the tight tendons and transfer them to another side of the body to help pull the foot in a different direction. 
Um, from an orthopedics perspective and orthopedist's perspective, it's very effective. Um, does it, is it effective at times? It sure is. Um, is it something that I would recommend as a first course? Um, to be honest, it is not. Um, for that, you know, if a muscle is tight where someone's thinking of moving it to a different part of the body, I think the first course of investigation is can that tight muscle be relaxed or be stretched? Um, because the analogous would hold true if that tight muscle becomes relaxed, then the muscles on the other side of the leg that are being forced to pull in the direction of the tight muscle are now tighter than the relaxed muscle. And then the foot can pivot back to the position we would want. Um, surgery is a very quick fix. It's surgery. It's a couple hours and then recovery afterwards. Um, but the recovery is sort of the unknown and how people recover following a surgery like that. Um, they are usually in a boot or a brace or a cast for a few weeks then they transition from full immobilization to partial immobilization. And during that six to eight week healing time, the body is further tightening up. So now we're taking a tight muscle that we've surgically moved. We're putting everything in a cast and now everything is becoming tighter than it did day one. So now after six to eight weeks of being in a cast, now comes the burden of therapy to start loosening things up. Um, so, you know, in my perspective, surgery is certainly an option. I think it would be the third tier option where first tier would be physical therapy, a consult with a physical medicine doctor alongside a neurologist. And why I say a neurologist is the physical therapist is going to start you on exercises and stretching exercises, and they'll document the effectiveness of your home exercises and they'll grade you as a good patient, bad patient on how well you're stretching and how often you're stretching. Um, if the stretching is not effective, then what a neurologist can look at is different pharmaceutical ways to help relax those muscles. And there are different pharmaceuticals that will relax muscles and cause them to not be so tight so that then the stretching can be more effective. If, I, if those combinations prove to be ineffective, then yes, surgery might be the best option um, after those attempts have been exhausted. Thank you for um, that good answer. Thank you. Sure. One of the questions here um, up in the chat, as I'm looking at the chat here, is do you recommend going to a podorthist when buying shoes? Sometimes. Um, podorthists as a profession, it, in my experience, to find a very good one, is very difficult. Um, Podorthics is a, it's a, an endangered profession. Um, it's a profession that people are not going into really anymore um, because it's been more or less absorbed by the field of orthotics um, or within a, a, a podiatry practice. Um, podi some podiatrists do still employ podorthists and a podorthist will have some recommendations when it comes to shoes. On the overall educational perspective, um, podorthists receive the least amount of education um, of all the foot and ankle specialists who handle medical devices. Um, orthotists are getting away from, and sort of a double-edged sword, orthotists are getting away from providing shoes in their office because of insurance reimbursement and the stack of paperwork that the federal government requires everybody to complete in order to get a pair of shoes through an orthotics practice. So a lot of orthotists are getting away from shoes, as are a lot of podiatrists. Podiatrists are viewing shoes more as a retail um, type of endeavor versus a clinical endeavor. Um, but I would recommend maybe consulting an orthotist over a podorthist when it comes to just shoe consultation. Um, if it comes to shoe inserts, um, and you're looking at foot orthotics, I would recommend foot or an orthotist over um, podorthist for the foot orthotic aspect of it. Um, but, you know, I would, a podiatrist, I think, is a better option to talk about yeah. shoes than a podorthist. Would you say that again? You would recommend whom over whom? Um, I would recommend either a podiatrist or an orthotist uh, when it comes to discussing shoes. Um, pedorthists in general 
uh, receive the least amount of education in graduate schools and clinical schools compared to those other two professions. Um, unfortunately, a lot of podiatrists and orthotists are getting away from actually keeping shoes in their office and delivering shoes to patients because of the insane amount of uh, paperwork involved with filing those claims to Medicare and to insurance companies. Um, but as far as a knowledge base, I think orthotist and uh, podiatrist is a better route to go for uh, just general conversation. When it comes to looking at shoes, I would look at um, ASIC and New Balance for a good pair of shoes as far as a uh, what looks like a, a tennis style shoe or a running style shoe um, because they are the roomiest. They have the most room. They're also the most balanced shoe that I've seen on the market. Okay, Joe, I'm sorry, I'm going to yes. inter intervene. We are going to take 20 minutes that we would have had dedicated to our just open discussion at the end of the meeting to give us a little more time to ask questions. There is a follow-up or related question in the chat about using an image generated um, on a computer in a shoe store to purchase a pair of shoes. Do you see that as legitimate or... Really? Um, I do not. Um, that's a great question. Um, I tried, I went to CVS once and stood on the Dr. Scholl's machine because I wanted to see what my fancy competitor was offering. And it was one of the worst foot orthotics I ever got, <laughs> okay. to be perfectly honest. Um, there's really nothing, you know, we've tried in our office, a lot of the 3D scanning techniques um, for scanning foot orthotics. And I, you get a reasonable foot orthotic as a, um, th as a product that comes out of it. From my opinion, there's still nothing better than manually manipulating the foot either into a foam box or in doing a, an actual plaster slipper cast. Um, so I might be a little old school in it. Um, after 20 years of making foot orthotics, I think I might be a little set in my ways. Um, I am computer savvy and I like technology for a lot of things, but for something like that, where there's an, a joint and we have to manipulate a, th a foot in three-dimensional space, there's, I still think there's nothing better than physical manipulation to create that mold. Okay, thank you. We have a question about OSER foot ups for foot drop, O-S-S-U-R. Yes, um, I am not a fan of it, to be perfectly honest. Um, I've used them in the past. Um, I dissuade a lot of folks from trying to use them. Uh, the big reason for it is the OSER foot up, where it connects on the body, is not enough leverage to actually lift the foot for foot drop. Um, it will keep the foot maybe at best in that L position, um, that position of neutral, but it will not bring the foot into dorsiflexion when... You, the foot needs to be in dorsiflexion for swinging the leg through in space. Um, the support that goes right around the calf just above the ankle, the other part goes right around the midfoot or in some cases laces into a shoe. And the, it's, it's kind of analogous to taking an ace wrap and doing a figure eight wrap around your ankle. Mm -hmm. It will get you by, but it is not really a functional approach. Okay, Ron Milford has a long question. Would you like to uh, voice it, Ron? Uh, sure, thanks. Um, my question's about uh, compression socks and I have uh, quite a, I've had neuropathy in my feet for about six years. And um, I wear the socks most of the day um, and I have an orthotic, a soft orthotic in my shoe but what I find is that my feet get, my feet themselves get more numb and more stiff um, during the day. And then I do, a, I do stretching exercises in the, in the late in the afternoon and I take the socks off then and my feet feel so tight and I'm wondering whether I'm actually doing any damage to my feet wearing the compression socks and whether I should think about a kind of a, um, a compression sock without a foot in it, a cover that covers my foot, or should I be wearing a sock in addition to wearing a, a, an athletic sock over the compression sock? And would that help in any way? Or do you have any advice about Yeah, that? I definitely would not double the sock. 
Yeah. Um, I would look at the amount of compression that that prescription called for. Um, you look at compression, uh, prescription grade compression socks, it's by uh, millimeters of mercury um, is the amount of compression yeah. that it provides. Yeah. Um, and it's very possible that they're just overpowering you mm. and not giving that bellowing effect that it's supposed to. A compression sock is supposed to expand and contract based on your body's movement to get fluid from down in your feet up into your body because either the ve the channels in the veins have weakened a little bit and they're not able to work themselves or there's enough muscle weakness where there's no muscle contraction that actually squeezes those veins to get the blood moving and that's what a compression sock does is it more or less acts as artificial muscle compression to get all the fluid up out of the bottom of your feet if the sock is overpowering and too tight uh, then there's not enough expansion and contraction and it just acts like a cast. And that can do the same effect as not wearing it and having the swelling. So it may just be that, you know, depending on your size, your physiology, how you're walking, um, if you're not taking big steps with enough to really cycle that ankle and move the muscle, and if there's not a lot of calf muscle mass there to be moved, then my, my guess would be right away to try a lighter compression sock or even okay. a non-prescription compression sock um, that you see athletes wear, again, from Dick's Sporting Goods is a nice, happy medium um, and see if that provides any benefit to you. Great. Thank you. Sure. Joe, this is uh, Joanne Jessen. I wear two braces from Infinite Technologies. Mm -hmm. Not the, they're, they're fixed. They're they don't bend at the ankle. And I have found that the ortho feet shoes are really good for me because I just take a one, uh, a wider width and they also come with extra inserts if I need them, which I haven't needed. Yeah, ortho feet's a great, that's a very good shoe okay. um, and very brace friendly. Yes, yeah. But now if a person has the fixed braces, is there any way I could ever move to a, a movable ankle when I don't, you know, by stretching my Achilles tendon? Possibly. Um, some braces, and I believe the ones that you have are a carbon fiber yes. uh, brace. There is a degree of internal flex in that brace. Um, so it's not a truly rigid brace. And why we like those carbon fiber ones, um, there's a term in the industry called energy return. And what that is, is the brace um, and... Anybody who dr drove cars back in the 70s and 80s knew what uh, leaf spring shocks were in the rear suspension of your cars, which is basically a strip of metal that you can compress and you load it and then it springs back. So the carbon fiber braces, what's very nice about those is they have that same leaf spring um, mechanics to the brace, where even though there's no hinge that's physically moving, the brace itself is able to bend and flex with the body. And with those carbon fiber braces, you get about 10 degrees of movement mm -hmm. off neutral. So you can get all, you can get up to 10 degrees plantar flexion and up to 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. So depending on each person, um, some folks have other weakness in other areas that um, cannot use a fully articulating full 20 to 40 degree range of motion joints. And that's where that carbon fiber is a nice middle of the road. It's not so rigid that it locks you up. Um, but it's not completely flexible where it gives 100% freedom of movement. Um, migrating from one to another, yeah, if, you know, with stretching and enough flexibility, that gives a uh, clinical case and a clinical change case to Medicare to warrant paying for a more, an articulating pair at that time, for sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have two more questions in the chat. Um, Mike Foxworth, if you would go ahead, please. All right, Mike isn't available. Jessica, go ahead about your sandals question. You need to unmute. Yep, all done. Uh, yes, thank you, Joe. Um, I wear sandals. I find it very uncomfortable to wear shoes. Um, okay. Partly, I do have the calluses. I have small fiber neuropathy. And it just makes my foot not fit so easily, even on a larger shoe. But I'm just wondering if it's possible to wear an orthotic with a sandal. And I have, this is what I wear as a 
rocker, Masai Barefoot technology mm-hmm. is the MBT. It's very comfortable because I can at least get all the pressure off by doing this. Sure. And actually that is a good sandal for an orthotic because it has a heel strap. Um, okay. Shoes that are not orthotic compatible are clogs, um, open back flip-flops or open back sandals. If there okay. is a heel there, it keeps the foot inside the sandal better and it can help keep the orthotic in. Um, in cases where orthotics do slide out, it's as simple as a piece of Velcro um, to hold it in, or in some cases we glue them in so that you get the openness of the sandal, but then the support of the orthotic. Good to know. Thank you. And looking at Mike's question in the chat room here, um, even though he wasn't there, it's one that is certainly worth answering. Um, and he wrote, uh, Medicare sent him to a company that fit him with a rigid orthotic. It was too dangerous, so he really couldn't walk with it. Could, uh, with Medicare, could he have asked for a better one or a flexible one? So Medicare has a, a, the draconian-like um, regulations when it comes to braces and orthotics. Um, on the low end, the diabetic shoe insert, if it's a diabetic insert, Medicare will give up to three of those per year and pay for them. Um, I never recommend getting all three at once because there's a, a chance your foot may change throughout the year. So if your orthotist or your podiatrist gives you three sets of inserts um, or wants to give you three sets of inserts in September, you're stuck with those three sets of inserts until the following September. If your foot changes in February, they have to either make adjustments to those inserts or pay, you have to pay out of pocket for another one until that calendar year resets. So it's always better to ask for one set and then a few months later, go back for a follow-up, have your foot checked at that time. If it looks the same, great. And then you get the same orthotic. But if there's been a change, now at least you know Medicare will pay for that second one. When it comes to more durable bracing like AFOs, ankle braces, and the like, uh, Medicare has what's called a reasonable useful life on ankle braces for five years. So if you receive, and this goes for anything that is considered an ankle brace. So if you go for surgery at your podiatrist and your podiatrist gives you a walking boot, a walking boot is an ankle brace. Those cam walkers, those pneumatic boots, air casts, those are ankle braces. Medicare will not, without a significant fight, pay for a different type of ankle brace for five years. Um, Even if you've had a change in diagnosis, change in size, um, if you've thrown out that boot because you needed it only for six weeks and you don't need it anymore, but now you need a different device, Medicare's initial answer is no in those cases. Um, And it's a big fight for podiatrists, orthotists, to battle Medicare and appeal Medicare for that other device. So it's just something to keep in mind as you're looking at devices um, that Medicare is very, very stringent and stingy with what they will pay for. And there's been a lot of of news articles in the podiatry magazines of podiatrists and orthopedists giving an initial post-operative device And then three months later, somebody needs a long-term device and that long-term device that costs a lot more isn't getting paid by insurance because the initial more disposable device was paid at the time of surgery or at the time of initial therapy. Um, So it is a little bit of a buyer beware type of a thing that we try to inform everybody of because Medicare is, they're not in the business of paying for things, unfortunately. They are saying no a lot more and we're seeing that happening a lot at the expense of getting patients the right type of device. Um, But going back to a little bit of Mike's question there, if you've been given a device by a provider, um, there is a reasonable time where that device can be either exchanged or redone. Um, And it usually is around the 60 day mark. So I encourage anybody who's getting a device from other providers, from their orthopedists or their podiatrist, if that device doesn't feel right, be in that office often for adjustments. Make sure it is right. Make sure it's something you can use. Um, any ankle device should accompany a physical therapy appointment um, because it's the physical therapist's job to show you how to walk in it, how to use it, how to accommodate it into your life. Um, podiatrists, they treat the foot. They treat what's outside the foot, inside the foot. They do surgery and they provide devices. They do not provide walking training 
Orthotis, same thing. We provide devices, hopefully very good ones, um, but we provide very cursory walking training, balance training, um, cognitive training with the devices, and that's where physical therapists come into play. Um, we're very fortunate in our office where we have physical therapy on site, so we can intertwine the two disciplines right then and there for a patient's benefit. Okay, thank you, Joe, for those cautionary notes. We have th time for these last three questions in the chat. Peter Coro, you have a question about the degree of the angle. Yeah, I got mine from Joe, and it's it's not. This is supposed to be like when adjusted to ninety degrees, or right now the normal one is like this. But you know, you, the screws down here, you adjust it. Now, I know if you come in and to see if it's adjusted correctly or not. Yeah, so actually, Peter, if you can hold that up there, that's a perfect thing to demonstrate. So this brace is called an assistive ankle foot orthosis. Um, inside the channels on the side of the brace are two sp are springs. So the, the back channel over by Peter's uh, left hand there by the heel has a spring in it that is actively picking the foot up. Go ahead and lift the brace a little bit more for me, Peter. There you go. So if you see the angle of the brace, that is a very sharp angle that's greater than that's a dorsiflexed position. When the brace is on, the weight of the body will push the foot down. Peter, if you don't mind flexing that brace for me, just sort of opening it up there. There you go. Perfect. So that brace will expand. And when that happens, he's loading that spring and compressing that spring. So now when the foot wants to swing through and the foot comes off the ground, that brace will pick up the foot, hold the foot up with that spring, allow the foot to swing through and repeat the process. So those springs are adjustable. In some cases we can give, right now his brace is set in 90 degrees and that can be used to help to control a knee that may wanna go backwards. It can also be used to help control uh, that plantar flexion position we were talking about. So that's a very dynamic setting that can change monthly, yearly, depending on a patient's needs. Um, the more movement we give, the more fluidity somebody has but sometimes the less stability somebody has. So we try to find a happy medium. And many times we're holding somebody in that L position and then allowing the foot to come up with that spring. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brenda Cheadle, I know you've been struggling with a very painful foot for uh, a, quite a few months. Would you like to ask a question uh, in your chat? Uh, yes, I have a, a long history uh, ever since uh, the beginning of July, I've had swelling in my right foot, a red area near the two smallest toes. My podiatrist told me I had a neuroma. He had been treating me for a, a neuroma for two years. I decided to see someone else. I saw a podiatric surgeon. Uh, he did, had an MRI and x-rays done. He said I never had a neuroma. Uh, then he sent me to a foot and ankle specialist who sent me for an ultrasound for venous insufficiency, but my veins are fine. And then the foot and ankle specialist said, you know, uh, rest or ICE. Uh, I've been icing it several times a day. I uh, have been elevating it, but the idea of putting on pressure uh, was just too uh, intensely painful to stand. So there's pain every step on my right foot. I thought maybe a neurologist could help, so I may have an appointment for him next Friday, but it sounds like until I get rid of the swelling, I'm going to have this pain. I've been elevating above the heart, but elevation is very painful. I feel the nerves squirming and moving about. Uh, I've been wearing nothing but uh, worn out bedroom slippers for the last couple months because putting shoes on is painful. So I'm really stuck. <laughs> Have you tried compression socks at all? Putting compression on that area is extremely painful. It's extremely painful, okay. It's red, it's swollen, uh, that area near the toes. I thought mm -hmm. I thought trying, what I just ordered were some uh, toeless socks that are meant for uh, like, like uh, plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do have some pressure that will be on because the ankles are also swollen they do have some pressure that then would be on the ankle and a large part of the foot but perhaps not the swollen area i thought i might try that next have you tried any sort of a foot orthotic in the past uh 
in the past, I've had orthotics. I haven't worn. I was a teacher, so I was on my feet all the time with mm-hmm. six graders. Uh, since retiring, I haven't worn orthotics, except when we were traveling. I wear them in my uh, sport shoes because there was a lot of walking involved, but mm-hmm. not, in, not in recent years. I wondered, do I have to wait till the swelling is gone before I can get an orthotic? Not at all. Um, in many cases, the swelling may not go back if there's still, what well, may not go away if there is still insult and bombardment of pressure and problems to that area. Um, Because again, swelling can be a defense mechanism. So it would be worth looking at and entertaining a pair of orthotics to off-weight the sensitive area. And that may help to break the cycle and allow healing to start. Where are you located? Um, We have five offices through Virginia. Uh, We're in Fairfax City, Loudoun, Warrington, Fredericksburg, uh, Arlington. Yeah, I think that's everybody. And where can you personally be seen? Um, I am personally out of the Fairfax office. Okay. I live uh, in Burke, very close to Fairfax, then it's away. Okay. I know Uh, Burke very well. So is uh, Infinite Technologies, is that what I look for to find uh, address and so on? Yep. You can go right there. Um, You can go on infinitetech.org is our website. And all the addresses and phone numbers are right on the website. Um, our off main office number is 703-807-5899. And actually, I'll put some of this information into the chat here. Thank you. Your, your timing could not be better because I've been feeling pretty helpless and hopeless. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Brian, you have a question about varicose veins, and then Mike will be the last question for today. Well, yes. Um... Um, compression socks be the good way to go with um, varicose veins in the ankle? Um, it might be. When it comes to the varicose veins, I would certainly consult a vascular specialist first um, because uh, compression stockings could cause more of an occlusion um, and cause more issues to the varicose areas. So I would, absolutely, I would consult a, ver- a uh, vascular specialist before purchasing them. Okay. okay good, I will. Mike Foxworth, you get the last question for Joe today. Uh, It's related to his earlier question. Suppose you are offered a rigid device. Can you refuse it and ask for an upgrade to a flexible, I'm assuming under Medicare? You can. um, A lot, you know, it would depend, of course, on the clinical reason you're being seen for that device to begin with. Um, ultimately that would be a conversation first between you and your orthotist and then your orthotist and your doctor. Um, in or, you know, if your doctor had sent a prescription over to the orthotist for a specific device, then the orthotist is required to consult with your doctor because that would constitute a change in prescription. And in the medical hierarchy, we can make recommendations, but we cannot countermand your physician. So it's certainly a valid question to ask. And I would encourage you to have the conversation with your orthotist, depending on the orthotist you see, they may be very up, uh, up on different joints and different articulations. Um, If they're a somewhat conservative orthotist or just not very technically savvy, they may not be up on that level of technology. So I would have that conversation first, if you're confident in their abilities then it would be on them to talk to your doctor on your behalf, weigh the pros and cons and offer you different options. Okay, and the final question that someone asked, um, is OrthoFeet a sock or a shoe? There seems to be some confusion and uh, where can you buy them? Okay, um, that was that was uh, me that brought up OrthoFeet. It's, it's a whole line of shoes. They have a website and believe me, once you buy a pair of shoes, you will hear from them almost every day. <laughs> uh, you'll never be, uh, it, it, they'll never be hard to find once you get to them. And, and where can you find them? Where can you buy them? Orthofeet.com. Um, th- they're, they have a whole line for both men and women and um, different styles. And some are 
sandals. They, they keep introducing more. I wear the sort of the like the keen sandal, you know, with, but it has a closed toe. And then I have sneakers. From Can that. you only buy them online? There's no place to try them? As far as I know, yes. I, but I may be wrong on that. But I have another question for Joe. Are you an orthopist? I am, yes. Okay, that's you're the yes. formal title. For that me. is our formal title. Okay, thank yes. you. Informally, it's Brace Guy. <laughs> okay. Let it's me okay. just jump in. Let me jump in and say that OrthoFeet always has a big discount every time there's a holiday. That holiday weekend, they're going to give you 10%, 20% off. So if you go and take a look and you think you might like their product, wait for a holiday weekend and you'll get a much better rate. My husband uses That's those. That's a good point. Yes, yes. Thank Very you, Brenda. True. Steve, would you now like to uh, open the discussion and ask for new um, members to introduce themselves? But before sure. that, of course, we're going to say a big thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I want to thank you. I thought it was an outst both an outstanding general presentation, and it was very specifically directed to my problem. I'm, uh, I found it very helpful. And I hope you said Rodney will continue to transcribe through this program. So I hope I hope he'll do so because I'd like to review the transcript very carefully, but he made some excellent points that uh, were well worth hearing. And I thought it was really, very, very helpful, Joe. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure. And hopefully next year we can, uh, I can see you guys in person. Okay. <laughs> thank you. All right, take All right, care thank everybody. You. Thank you. Right. Okay, Steve. As, as far as, yes, so, um, I, Shall I check uh, the, it says we're up to 27, no, 27 in the chat. Let's see. We have, we have 25 participants. Should I call on a name that I'm not familiar with and on the assumption that these are new people? I think we'll just ask if there's anyone in the group. Okay, well, if there's anyone on the list who hasn't been in the chat in, in the Zoom before, uh, please uh, start. Jessica, should we start with you? Because I don't recall. Yeah seeing your name before. Yeah, I went to the uh, social that you guys had where people didn't talk about neuropathy. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so I was recently diagnosed with small fiber neuropathy. I live in State College, PA. And I'm just learning. Last week I had a one hour telehealth appointment with a Cleveland Clinic neurologist. I found that really helpful. And uh, hopefully I'll go down to Johns Hopkins and be able to get some of the extra tests he said to see if it's just sensory or also sensory and um, autonomic. So. Great. Well, uh, that's the good thing about Zoom. We can bring in State College PA as well as uh, Annandale or Arlington. So it is nice. And, Thank you. And we, and we do, we're pretty consistent about meeting the first Saturday of every month with the exception of July uh, usually not, and sometimes not August, but certainly between now and the end of the year and to next year, we'll be meeting the first Saturday. And so, and Judge has done a very good job of, of keeping our email list up to date. So you'll get all the notices uh, automatically pretty much of our upcoming meetings. And so hope you'll be an active member of the group. Steve, yeah, may I, Steve, may I interrupt and remind people, if you go to our website, dcpnsupport.org, and it's in the chat, and you click on join, then you are added to our, our mailing list. Uh, just attending a Zoom session does not right. make automatically. Right, you have to affirmatively join. Right? So right. join at the website, and I'll put it up again. And I would like to say a particular hello to Patricia Hauser who is here today, I think for the first time. And if I'm correct, uh, you are part of the Pittsburgh group. Is that correct, um, Patricia? That is correct. I'm part of the Pittsburgh group. And uh, welcome. Thank you for attending. Is there anything you would like to ask or share with our group? I've been very interested in the presentation today. I'm a fan of OrthoFeet, so I was glad to hear him endorse that. Um, it's just nice to see how your support group works. Ours is not nearly as professional as yours is, but it's great to be linked up. Excellent. Thank you for taking the time to join us, and we look forward to working with you uh, even more in the future. Okay, Thanks. Steve, go ahead. Well, again, I don't know all the... Is Anne a new person? I see a name, Anne. I don't recognize an Anne in the group. Bradley. 
Ann Bradley, is, is she on the call now? Ann, would you like to speak? You need to unmute. You need to unmute. Got it. There you go. Uh, no, I am not a new person. I did talk briefly last month and um, I went to one or two of your in-person meetings a few years ago, mm -hmm. but, but no, I'm not new. Oh, okay. You. Was there anything you want to uh, raise today? Not really. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Well, again, throw it out to anybody who is new, who would like to uh, volunteer. How about Nan Verhoff? Is she new or I don't know? Nan? Uh, looks like she's not there right now. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Ron Medford. I'm new. Uh, this is okay. my first time joining. Can you hear me? Yes. Where, where, where are you located, Ron? Uh, I'm in Bethesda. I, oh, okay. Uh, not, not today, but we're in our house in Southern Maryland. But um, so I had very, I have, all I know about my neuropathy is that it's idiopathic and uh, the doctor was never able to understand what calls it. He said about a third of the patients have it. I'm fortunate that I don't have any pain. Um, so, um, but I have, you know, over the last you know, six years or so, since I first beginning to experience numbness, continue to get mostly numb feet and it certainly affects my balance. And um, I do find that doing daily stretching exercises, not just for my neuropathy, but that in part for that, but Doing daily stretches exercises has been really great for um, my health in general. You have also, a set. Of, you have a set of those exercises you could share um, with the group. Yeah, those, those those I got from my physical therapist, and they're proprietary to the therapeutic oh. firm that she represents. So uh, I've been. I was as a condition of using them was until, uh, until I couldn't share them. So, but um, but yeah, and I initially went for my neck. I have had posture issues because I've worked over a computer for 30 years with my neck burn. So I went for that, but uh, included in that, because I had neuropathy, I asked for some balance exercises and some stretches for my lower, um, for my feet, especially. And, and she's given me some of those that are, are helpful. So um, I found that, that helpful, but um, yeah. And then I was diagnosed with, um, you know, I had varicose veins, and I went to the to my uh, to a, a doctor that my that was recommended by my primary physician to be evaluated for, you know, cardiovascular um, disease in my uh, veins, and he did detect some in there, and that's where the prescription for um, compression socks came from. But I also read in some of the compression um, sock literature that um, you could really should really consult your neurologist before you wear compression socks. And so I went ahead and did that. And I, I talked to my uh, doctor over the phone and he said he thought it was fine and didn't see any issue with it. But I do have, have experienced as a result of where, as you, as you heard, I've had this uh, numbness. And I think um, what uh, Joe had to say was pretty good about whether or not I'm wearing socks that at least for my feet are just too tight and uh, I feel like it exacerbates the, the numbness as the day wears on. So, Have you found an easy way to put them on and take them off? Um, you know, I, you know, I've been doing it for more than, for more than a year now. And um, I, yeah, first of all, you have to roll them, roll them up and uh, get your, get uh, the kind I wear are these kind of, uh, Let's see if I can get my foot that high in the air. Can you see these? these oh, right. So this is this is what I wear because they're they're really good for um, you know wearing with my tennis shoes, and so I walk in these things, and um, and uh, but I have that have that problem. So I just roll my I roll them down, and getting them off is a little harder than getting them on, quite frankly. Um, but uh, I, I went to get a new prescription filled uh, recently, or get to get new socks and. Uh, People, the medical supply suggested I try a different brand that maybe not be so tight. So this is kind of consistent with what Joe was telling me. So maybe I have one that's too tight. So I think that's important to understand. What brand is the one that you just showed on your foot? Jobs, J-O-B-S. Oh yeah, that's pretty standard yeah. in the area, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do have a third. I have, a, I have a, these are all athletic ones, but I have a non-athletic sock that's not as tight, but it's heavier wool for the winter time, and I find it easier and kind of more comfortable to wear. But it's too hot to wear in the summer. 
There are some braces that you can buy, in very plastic ones, where you drape the sock over the brace, and then you stick your foot in, and then you pull it up. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I used have, to have those. Yeah, I don't have any trouble I, at all getting them on. I just, oh, really? I just okay. Roll all, I roll them all the way down, so I, as I stick my foot in, and they're all the way rolled down, then they can okay. come back up, and yeah. When they're first new, they're hard to get on, but after you wear them every day right. for a year, they're not. So I also want to endorse the OrthoFeet um, company. Uh, I've had, okay. you know, uh, mostly uh, uh, bedroom slippers. I've tried. I don't wear their. Um, I don't wear their tennis shoes. That they're too wide for me, quite frankly. And I think for lots of people that's really good, but for me it's not. And but I do wear their house slippers, and uh, I find them really great. And, uh, yeah. We have three there, Steve, with their hands raised, and then we're going to have to move on to the final uh, part of the meeting. Okay. The Was Bruce first? I see Bruce and Mike. That's the only two I see. And Rebecca Hotop. Oh, I don't. I didn't see Rebecca. Go yeah. ahead, Rebecca. Hi. I just put into the chat. Um, there's a couple of websites people might be interested in. One is called saveourbones.com and has a 30 second balance challenge test you can take and offer some suggestions. And again, I put it in the, in the chat, saveourbones.com. And there's another one I like is called betterfive.com and it has some good foot and uh, knee and balance exercises. Um, better five, number five? Better five. Yeah, better five, the number five, better five, uh, dot com. Okay. And it I'll is remind in the everyone, chat. I'll remind everyone that you can save the chat at the end of the meeting so that all of these um, resources that people have identified, you'll have a reference. They are also going to be posted as they are each month by Judd and Mike um, on our website. So you can find them again but you can save the chat yourself. Okay. Uh, Bruce? Yes, uh, Jessica, uh, I wanna thank you for your comments. I'm very happy that uh, you found my, uh, my uh, September happy hour useful and that you were able to locate the, uh, the support group by attending the happy hour. And our next one will be October 7. So if uh, Pat would pass me, or if she would pass me your email address, I will make sure you're invited to Thank my you. happy hour on October 7th. Brenda, where's Brenda? Are you there, Brenda? Brenda Cheadle. Brenda, I see her name. I don't see her face, but that's all right. Can you hear me, Brenda? Well, she's muted, she's yeah. she's uh, Brenda, I, I just wanted to ask you, when you're swollen the uh, foot, is on both feet or just one? Uh, as I, she's talked oh. with me, it's on her right foot, as I understand it. Only her right foot. Okay, well that's a that is difficult then to help her. I thought if it was on, if it was on both feet, it might be uh, something to do with the uh, circulation or the. Uh, it's it's worth checking with. I don't know maybe a cardiologist and getting a diuretic that might drain the uh, swelling, but if it's just one foot, I'm not sure that's useful, so I, I'm not um, knowledgeable enough to judge one foot only. The redness could be just an abrasion of what she's wearing currently on that foot, but does anybody have an opinion on a diuretic to stop the swelling? I think she had a vein study done. I'm not well. That's sure. yeah, she that's mentioned different. that. Yeah. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. I know, but yeah. I'm just trying to fill in the. the yeah, picture. I heard. Her. I heard what she said. I take a diuretic, but I still have swelling and and inflammation sometimes. So there's no in both, in both there's no cure all. In both feet or one. In both feet. Well, that's sure. No, it's not a cure all, of course. No, okay, forget it. Thank you. Okay, Mike, you're the last comment in the open discussion, please. I, I just wanted to respond to, to Ron. Um, he said he felt fortunate that he didn't have much pain. Um, just would caution that uh, it's, you're not home free 
if you don't have pain. Uh, the uh, the balance degradation is still over, perhaps over the horizon. I don't know. I don't know what your full the scope of what you're dealing with is, but uh, all of us with PN are, are going to face with the degradation of our muscles and exercise is very important. That's not something most of us are told early on when they're first diagnosed. I don't know, that may be changing now, but it certainly wasn't true when I was diagnosed 20, however many years ago it was, and uh, 23, I guess now. And, and so, yes, yes, I felt very, very lucky. And I said to myself for about 13 years, boy, I'm lucky, I don't, I don't have much pain. Boy, I'm so lucky. Well, during those 13 years, my ner the nerves in my legs just got, uh, they died and they died and they died and now I don't walk very well. So, so don't, you're not home free. No, I'm, uh, thanks Mike. I, I'm already uh, experiencing the, uh, the, the balance problems uh, yeah. already. I mean, uh, I find uh, that pretty significant. I have a couple of exercises that I do for balance, but I never, I'm never very successful at them. And it feels like I can feel the fight that's going on between, um, you know, the neuropathy and me trying to do things to help maintain my balance and, um, and, uh, I'm, I'm definitely worried about that in, in the future. I'm also worried about, you know, whether I'm going to, how long I'll be able to continue to drive. You know, that really is on my mind. That gives me a perfect segue into Helene Zonderman. We have a new feature um, that we're uh, celebrating and that is called PN Victories. And mm -hmm. Helene has had a recent victory that she would like to share. Go ahead, Elaine. I have. I've had peripheral neuropathy for over 15 years. And like most people, I waited too long and driving until I really shouldn't have been driving anymore because um, I was losing sensation in my feet. So I went and I took uh, hand control lessons at Good Samaritan Hospital in Baltimore. And I recently got my permission to to take the driving license test with the state of Maryland. You have to, like you're 16 years old, you have to go and take your driver's license test. So I did with hand controls and I backed into a space and I did a three point turn and I've gotten my new driver's license with hand controls. And on Wednesday, I got myself a brand shiny new car hey. with hand controls. And a sweet job, and um, I'm more nervous about the new car than I am about the hand <laughs> controls. But uh, it definitely it was a, a months long, many months long process, and I have it sitting in my driveway, and it's just it's a great feeling to have that independence again. And what, uh, what did you buy? What did you buy? I bought myself a Toyota Corolla hybrid so that I can try to help the environment as well as myself. And I had the hand controls installed at Bedco Mobility in Baltimore. And, uh, you know, other than a, a slight case of nerves, I've been doing okay. I went out on the beltway one day already. Ooh, and, I think this uh, is fantastic news. Thank you, Helene. Yeah, thank I'm, you. I'm going to, let's say, a round of applause for that success. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Helene to put uh, Bedco Mobility in our resource directory. Okay. Um, if you will add that, because I'm sure people would like to know, other than uh, Northern Virginia, where can you go? Which leads me to back to Steve. And would you like to announce your more formal announcement of your new group that you're starting in Maryland, Steve? Yeah, so on November 18th, which is a Thursday, uh, and we'll make sure everybody gets the notice. I, I drafted a notice. Uh, we're going to start what I hope will be an ongoing monthly meeting, depending on how many people show up. We'll see what the interest is. Uh, if, if we can't do it monthly, maybe we'll do it quarterly uh, and, and build slowly but surely. But our first speaker is going to be Ahmed Hoke, uh, who many of you know from Hopkins. And 
he initially agreed to be sort of our informal medical advisor uh, because Suburban Hospital, who I'm doing with, doing it with, has has their policy. They like to have a medical person be kind of attached to the support group. So, in a fairly short order, maybe the same day of emails, he suggested one of his junior colleagues, Brett McRae, to be our medical advisor. And I feel bad for McRae a little bit because he's he's been presenting all over the place. He on September 30th presented before a thousand people that the foundation had gathered on genetic testing and, uh, um, hereditary. and hereditary, hereditary neuropathy. Then we have him, it's coincidentally, Joanne got him to be our speaker on November 6th, and she could speak to that a little bit. Uh, and then uh, I've invited him to come to be introduced on November 18th. And then I made the mistake of saying, <laughs> are you free on December 16th, which will be our first monthly meeting, second monthly meeting, you could you could be the featured speaker. And he 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 thought I was sort of assuming that he's gonna come every single month from now on. So I relieved him of that apprehension and said, No, I don't want you every month. Uh, and I have to speak to him. Um, the the one concern I had about it is uh, some of us shared this Judd and and Pat, is we observed his presentation uh, before the 11,000 people that was a webinar, so we couldn't you know, be seen or say anything. And it was very technical, very academic. And so that's a concern, especially if we have a smaller group of people. Um, you know, we, don't, we don't need so much uh, technical description as we frankly benefit from how to do what to do kind of practical stuff that Joe was giving us. I mean, I thought Joe's presentation today was the ideal mix of theoretical, but also very practical. Um, and so I'll have to, we'll have to see how that's going to work. He is an academic after all, he's an assistant professor and he is a specialist now in CMT and hereditary. And, um, you know, we're, we're hopefully we can, you know, find out, you know, what, what else he wants to talk about. But it, it, this whole thing is going to be dependent on how much interest there really is. I'll, I'll finish with this. I was asked, I've mentioned this before, I was asked by Suburban Hospital to estimate how many people in Montgomery County, Maryland, have peripheral neuropathy. And I came up with 93,000. And the way I got that number was um, there's about six, six million people uh, live in Maryland, and uh, there's a there's a federal chart of how many people have diabetes in each state, and in Maryland, uh, that's over close to 500,000 people in the state of Maryland alone have diabetes, and then uh, Montgomery County is the most populous county. People don't realize it's more populous than Baltimore County, so doing some you know quick math, I came up with this figure of 93,000. And I think it's accurate. So we have so many people that have it and we could have probably a dozen support groups in Maryland. So we'll see if this one group can, can be the first group. This will be the first group in Maryland in over 20 years. When I, I came down with neuropathy in 2007 and I was told anecdotally that Suburban Hospital had a group maybe 10 or 20 years before that going into you know, maybe the 80s early 90s, and I could never find out anything more about it. And I kind of gave up on them, but then I started the conversation again. And now hopefully this will happen. So well, we'll keep you posted on that. Congratulations, Steve. We're looking forward to sure. great progress. Um, that again <laughs> is so everybody understands, Dr. McRae will be speaking to the DCPN group here uh, via Zoom. On November 6th, Dr. Hoke will be speaking to the new Bethesda Chevy Chase group that Steve is starting with Suburban on November 18th. So there's the distinction there. Dr. Hoke, if you're interested in hearing him, will be a more basic presentation overview of PN. And Dr. McRae will be talking to DC's group on uh, November 6th. I would like to acknowledge Diane Walters. I understand that she is here also from Pittsburgh as well as Pat Hauser. We heard from Pat, is Diane here still? She, she may have left. 
Okay, and um, also uh, Nan Verhoff, you are new. I'm not sure if I'm saying your name correctly. Would you like to introduce yourself? You need to unmute. Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm in Morristown, New Jersey, and um, I had attended a group that was meeting in Roseland for a while. I'm not even sure I, how I got on your list, except I have contributed to the National Peripheral the Neuropathy. Foundation. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's how I got on the list. So okay. when I saw the, the little flyer about what was coming up, I signed up for it, but then I missed the first 40 minutes because I was had another commitment. But um, this was very interesting today and it, it's kind of renewed my interest in um, maybe looking for somebody to I'm not diabetic, but I've had peripheral neuropathy for about 10 years and it is progressing and making it more difficult to move, to walk, to balance and all that. Yeah. And, um, and the, you know, the pain issues I have are, you know, compression stocks are out of the question. And, you know, the, the sloppy shoes, the ortho, ortho shoes are, are wonderful, but they're too sloppy for me. They're you know, I need something with more support. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I'm, I'm just trying to find my way like everybody else. Well, <laughs> so Welcome, and we hope you continue to join us as we uh, move forward. And um, I wanted to say my physical therapist told me that if you can take your shoe, I wish I had a shoe to show you, and bend it like a V, mm -hmm. you shouldn't buy it. It needs to be more so firm that it gives support and if you can bend it into a v it's not a good enough shape. right so i have echo sandals and those are my most comfortable because they hold my foot so nice and tight um, well, i think a good follow-up to this meeting is a uh, recording and or um active live presentation via zoom from a person who did a shoe presentation for cj holiday and um, it got very good response. And it seems like there's enough interest here that that might be a future speaker for us. And that leads me to CJ Holiday is a um, PN support group out of North Carolina, leads a PN support group out of North Carolina. His next monthly meeting is October 11th. That's Columbus Day, or I guess it's being renamed now. Uh, to Indigenous Day, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, October 11th at four o'clock, and I will put his contact information in the chat because it's very important. You must contact him to get an invitation. That's how he um, takes care Pat, of it. Pat, is it three o'clock or four o'clock? I thought it was three o'clock. I, he has it on uh, line as four o'clock. So okay. I think it's okay. always been four o'clock. He has a new feature that I think is pretty cool. He calls it his chat feature. And he is posting on his website, the chat conversation. As I said to you, you can save the chat from today that has all these references to ortho feet and such. Um, he is doing not only saving it for himself, but he's posting it on the website. So maybe Judd or Mike can do that for us because it would help with all these um, references that we've made. And the other one that I wanted to tell you is that Michael Wright's success story. If you're on Facebook, it's simply called Peripheral Neuropathy Success Stories. He has a recording available of his September 28th meeting called uh, Nerve Decompression Surgery. So if you're interested in that, his recording is up um, look on Facebook at Michael Wright's success stories or PN success stories. And the last thing I think is Rebecca, do you want to give us a quick update on our finances? Uh, sure. Um, I think uh, we have the same amount as we did last month, $1,600. Uh, we do have expenses folks. So you know, if you can contribute anything, you can go on to the uh, the DCPN uh, support group, you know, dot com. No, and no, let's correct that. DCPN support dot org dot org. Sorry. In the chat. 
or you can, in the basement. Or you can send me a check too. So uh, don't don't let us go bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and yep. and yep. again, I've always um, have to end on a positive note. I'm excited that there was so much participation today. I thought it was an excellent presentation, and I. Um, encourage you if you have any interest in supporting the continuation of this group we need somebody to step forward to help us um, continue to run it and also to become the secretary rodney has done a tremendous job for more than a year um, it's time for someone else to uh, take a turn it's always good to benefit but you uh, many hands lighten the load did, did Judge say at the beginning that we have a budget now that's uh, uh, self-explanatory or we're still working on that in terms of income and expenses? Judd, would you like to answer that, please? Um, I, well, we we have a budget. I mean, uh, uh, Rebecca's managing the money, but we were looking for a way to show that that uh, would be understandable by a lot of people, the, the kind of We've been very complicated in the way we've uh, uh, described some of the expenses and, and withdrawal. But yeah, we have. I don't maybe, quite know what you're... Well, well, maybe it would be helpful to have some document that we could look at and see. So, for example, uh -huh. if there's something on the document, you know, $300 for such and such, maybe people could target certain donations and say, well, I'd like to support that part of the budget or that part of the budget. So the more the more disclosure we have of what the elements are, the, maybe the more likely people might be to donate to it. That's actually a, a good idea. We have been working on getting it in some kind of um, readable, user-friendly order. Just what our expenses are to operate. It, it costs money to run the website. It costs money for our Zoom account. So there are things that we need um, uh, help with and would appreciate. We will work on presenting that. Again, I can't tell you enough that you should really be looking weekly at the, at the website. Just there's so much new stuff for, you know, to be known about and to share in. For example, I almost forgot to mention that the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's um, recording of the hereditary and genetic testing um, webinar is up if you go to FPN uh, let me think, Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy.org. Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy.org and click on events. Uh, you'll be able to um, listen to that recording uh, by Dr. McCray. So we try to keep you up informed on not just what's happening in DC, but in North Carolina and in West Essex, New Jersey and Pittsburgh. So there's a lot happening. Bruce, do you have your hand up? I can't tell. <laughs> it's up. Yes, sir. Uh, I was going to add uh, Dr. And Dr. McCray from Johns Hopkins was supplemented by a genetic counselor woman also from Johns Hopkins. Christy Smith. But, yeah, the two of them presented together. And uh, uh, McCray was good on, especially on CMT uh, and the genetic counselor is useful to go through the possible genetic uh, antecedents you have that may have caused yours and the possibility of your transmitting it to your children or grandchildren. I think that's a useful combination. The only uh, drawback is that each of them are much too, they're very both academic in a sense. They talk about twice as long as they need to to explain what they're trying to say. They really are very basic and they don't seem to realize that they're repeating themselves and it, they take up too much time with presentation and leave no time for questions. So if you have them both, they're good, but tell them to just, just summarize in half the time they usually do. 15 minutes each instead of 30. Well, we can suggest, but of course, they may yes, see our, right. our presentation yes. is done. Jessica, you have your hand raised. Yes, I'm wondering, do we have to do anything to be part of the Maryland group or will we get an invitation, uh, Steve? Um, 
Not, well, I'm not really sure how that's going to work. I, my preference would be, frankly, to see who shows up from Maryland because I want to serve the people in Bethesda and Chevy Chase. And But the meeting is open to anybody. Uh, and so, sure, if you're in State College, PA, if you want to, you know, join us, I mean, uh, eventually it would be open to everybody. But at least initially, I'd like to figure out, you know, who's actually here from from BCC, so 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 called Bethesda Chevy Chase. As I understand it, there have more than twenty thousand people on the email list of, of Suburban Hospital. So, if you've ever had a reason to be associated with Suburban or perhaps even um, Hopkins, maybe you will already get uh, a flyer or information. Yeah, that's but one thing. It occurs to me. I'm going to speak this coming week with the lady who's in charge of the wellness program at Suburban. She's our sponsor to feel her out a little bit because for all I know, I, I can't imagine she'll say this, but she might say, you know, if we're gonna support a support group, we want it to be for people in Montgomery County. Uh, I, I'll have to feel my way about that. Uh, and if she insists upon that, you know, it's gonna be hard to control for that, but she, I'll, we'll have to see how that goes. I know like if, if anyone who's tried to get involved with, I've just been invited to speak at the uh, Riderwood Community um, PN group. I've been there two or three times before. And I asked them, frankly, I was a little reluctant to go to a nursing home and speak in person because of COVID. So they're arranging for a television monitor to be brought in so I can do it remotely even though he says most of their people don't use Zoom and don't know how to use Zoom, which surprised me a little bit. But their rules are very restricted, these retirement communities, that the only people who can be in their support groups are people who live in the community. And that makes sense. And there's a liability issue and a whole bunch of things. But we'll have to see about the new support group. If Suburban you know, has a policy that you have to be in Montgomery County to, to participate, I kind of doubt they will, but I'll let you know about that. That makes sense. And the other thing I was wondering about for Patricia Hauser, is there a Pittsburgh group? Because I'd emailed um, the group leader that was listed in the Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy and the emails kept getting returned. Is Pat still here? Yeah, there is a group in Western Pennsylvania. It's very small. Um, what, what, what in particular would you like to have? Uh, is it a Zoom meeting and can I join and who would I contact? Well, we're just, we're struggling to get Zoom up and running. And it, right now it isn't working very well. If you give me your email, I can certainly keep in touch with you. Okay. Mine is my first name, last name at Gmail. And I don't know if you can see since Jessica, I can't see you. Jessica. Pronounced Clodio, C-L-O-T-H-I-A-U-X at gmail.com. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the, earlier I mentioned that um, a, a core of a, a core group from this group is branching out to the Peripheral Neuropathy Support Network, and we are trying to help uh, the Pittsburgh group with a uh, Zoom, uh, establishing uh, a Zoom protocol there, and uh, we're hoping that that's going to go forward even as soon as their um, October meeting. So. Pat can certainly um, include uh, Jessica, I hope, in, in that invitation. And in the meantime, Jessica, you can always join us uh, each month via Zoom. Thank you. And now, officially, we are ending it. We try to end at 4 o'clock so people can plan dinner and such. But all are welcome to stay on as long as you'd like. Judd checks back. I check back. And uh, we will close the meeting when people are finished talking. So socialize, interact. Um, thank you for your participation. It was a great meeting. Agreed. See you thank on you, Pat. Thank November you. November 6th. Great. Right.